Hi, and welcome to the Audrain Automobile Museum and our exhibition, JDM and Beyond, The Worldwide Influence of Japanese Cars. For this segment, I'm joined by my friend Ben Chester, and we're going to take a look at something that a lot of people think of when they think of Japanese cars and bikes, diminutive size. And to do that, we're going to take a look at a 1992 AutoZam AZ1, a 1993 Toyota Serra, and a 1965. Now, these all have in common the fact that they are small in size, but they also have something else in common, which is the fact that, as we discovered before, detail in design and engineering is something that doesn't change no matter what the size of the, of the compass of the car right. or bike. Right. These, these two cars we're standing with are obviously very unique automobiles by today's standards. But in the early 90s, uh, Japan uh, was really looking to push their creativity boundaries and build cars that not only were useful, resourceful, economical, reliable, but also fun in all aspects of the term. So the gullwing doors, uh, the sporty handling, um, the overall visibility of the car made sense, and they were just, cars were fun to own. And it's also very interesting, the way that Japanese manufacturers collaborated with each other is something that's very interesting because people almost always think of Suzuki as a motorcycle manufacturer, right. although of course Suzuki has made cars and small trucks. And this car, the AutoZam AZ1, is in fact designed and engineered by Suzuki. Right. Uh, for uh, Mazda, mm -hmm. which sold it again. I love that whole idea of these different sales channels that they have in Japan. So this was sold by the AutoZam network that sold mm -hmm. a totally different line of cars to the standard Mazda cars. Do you think in a market the size of Japan, they had this incredible variety? Yeah, yeah, they, Mazda really knew what they were doing with this. Um, Suzuki engineered a great engine uh, for it, 660cc um, uh, K-class engine uh, that was turbocharged. So if you're using a car around, say, Tokyo, uh, where things are obviously very tight, um, and very congested at times. Um, a car like this uh, with mid-engine, rear-wheel drive, um, and plenty of pep to get you up to speed, um, something that truly made sense, and you could have fun you know, maneuvering your way around the city in it. Um, so this was a car that really um, was resourceful in so many different ways, and people just had fun even just commuting in it. It's one of those things as well that you mentioned, of course, the gullwing doors. Now, we most often see gullwing doors as a style affectation. Right. When you're designing a K car for small spaces, the doors make perfect sense. You don't have room to swing a door out. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a practical use for something that we associate almost exclusively with style. Yeah, yeah, of course. And something actually I learned uh, just last night from one of our docents. Um, if you have a K car in Japan, you actually uh, don't have to prove you have a parking space at your house. So it's just another benefit of owning this car in a congested city of Japan um, with a car of this size also, with an engine under 660 cc's, you're avoiding many automobile taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, so having that in this package truly makes a lot of sense, as opposed to something that was more of a utilitarian vehicle. Now, one of the things, too, that this shows so well is the fact that the basic tenet of Japanese design, whether it be in textiles, in, in painting, is all about detail. Mm. And in Japanese cars, they, they were prone to something called surface interest. So even in a very small car like this, you can't have long panels without decoration. Right. And so you see that there are vents and there are cut lines and there are indicator lights. There's yeah. something going on everywhere you look. And that was very important in Japanese design, Yeah. which brings us to the other car that we're standing mm -hmm. next to, uh, the Toyota Serra. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a story of Japanese sales channels mm -hmm. because the Serra was sold in the uh, Toyota Corolla store, mm -hmm. which sold this as opposed to 
the other Toyota Vista store, which sold the MR2, mm -hmm. which is very familiar to all of us here in the US, a little two-seater mid-engine runabout. Mm -hmm. And this is a two plus two mm -hmm. for the dimensionally uh, uh, not over-endowed. <laughs> um, but the, uh, it's a very interesting thing about this because this is one of the first cars that was designed in the US for Toyota mm -hmm. in their California studio, which mm -hmm. is headed by our friend Stuart Reed. Mm -hmm. And he did the exterior design of the uh, concept car, which became the uh, Syrah. And uh, it's fascinating to see also, I, I spoke in, and you can see actually a video on the, the uh, Drain Museum network of me driving the Syrah. Um, and it's a tremendous fun. It's not a fast car. The uh, underpinnings are quite humble. They're shared with the Starlet and the Paseo, mm -hmm. two very everyday Toyota models. Mm -hmm. But again, lifting the, the, the prosaic mechanicals to a totally new right. level through style. Right, right. Toyota wasn't out to make an exotic car with this. They were out to make a normal car feel more exotic. And just like this, AutoZam, every aspect of owning a car like this becomes fun. You open the doors in a parking lot, people are looking, people are asking questions. Um, it's got some really funky, um, not modifications, but additions into the car. The mats are of a unique color. It's got this very goofy backup sound that happens. Uh, it's basically telling you in Japanese that the car is backing up, um, something I've never heard out of, out of a, a car like this. But it just takes the mundane and makes it extraordinary. And how you can forget the sound system. Oh, of course. Which is absolutely amazing, the sound system in this car. Yeah. That has different modes uh, to, to suit your moods. Yeah. Um, and it's a very interesting thing. You mentioned the, uh, the backup narration. Mm -hmm. This is a time when uh, computers in cars were just really coming to the fore. And the Japanese were famous for their talking cars. Mm -hmm. The Nissan Maxima also had one of the early um, onboard computers mm -hmm. that talked to you about everything. It didn't just indicate that your door was open, it told you the door was open. Right. It didn't indicate that you'd left the lights on, it told you that the lights right. were on. And uh, so some of that is also very interesting. Looking back now at how quickly technology developed, we find this really curious. Back then it was absolutely cutting edge. This is the coolest thing in the world. This car talks to you. Right, right. Japan pulled out all the stops in the early 90s, and there was a serious crisis, uh, financial crisis that happened in the mid-90s where they really started to kind of close their walls, put the blinders on, and really focus on what was important. Uh, but cars like this showed just to what lengths they would go to give someone an out-of-the-ordinary driving experience. Or in, a com in a country like Japan, you're driving a lot. You're not really driving far, but you do have to drive to get around. Um, and it really is a, a benefit almost to your mental health to have something that you enjoy getting out of or even just backing up in, right? It's emblematic of the level of enthusiasm that exists in the Japanese market, yeah. as small as it is. Yeah. Um, it's something that um, people compare it often to Italy in the 1960s with the range of cars and the spirit of the cars. Mm -hmm. The spirit of the cars in Japan in the 1990s was a very specific time, yeah. and as you said, it, it, it betrayed um, it portrayed, rather, a certain exuberance and confidence that, that technology will solve anything and style wins everything. Right, right, and they proved themselves right, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're going to look at another true world beater mm. and something on two wheels rather than four. Mm -hmm. The best-selling motorcycle of all time, the Honda 55. Let's take a look. And as the Japanese manufacturers would conquer the US and the world in the 1980s and 90s, so they conquered first the world on two wheels mm -hmm. in the 1960s. No one could imagine that Honda could literally redefine the motorcycle market in the US with this series of trail bikes. Yeah. And uh, of course the famous campaign, you meet the nicest people on a Honda. Mm -hmm. It took the entire world of motorcycles out of gang world into community world. Yeah. And it was a very funny thing I was reading in, in uh, I think it was November 1962 Cycle World magazine. They did a review 
of the 55. And they said it was quite interesting because most people who ride them don't think of them as motorcycles or motorbikes. They're Hondas. Right. And uh, they finished their review talking about how incredibly capable it was, off-road and fun to, to ride, and uh, that it was okay that even if you were a committed motorcyclist, you could still enjoy this. Right, right. <laughs> this, this campaign uh, that this poster focuses on right here literally evolved motorcycling from uh, a g almost a gang activity, like you mentioned, to an everyday person's friendly activity. And this bike literally put many of those people onto two wheels for the first time, allowing them to then elevate to the next model, the next model, the next model, and then their kids are on motorcycles, and it just took the motorcycling world uh, by storm, such a kind of a diminutive looking thing. Uh, but I think you mentioned that this is the most sold motorcycle in the world, and it's actually also one of the most sold machines in the world. Talk, exactly. you, you know, you mentioned the refrigerator, the microwave. <laughs> the Trail 55 with this sort of engine is so popular that it's just stood the test of time. And it's also something because thinking about societies in the East, in Asia, in Europe, it was quite common for people to use their bicycles for everyday yeah. commerce, for shopping, for, for, for errands, mm -hmm. and it was not very much of a leap from there to scooters and small motorbikes. Mm -hmm. But that was not the case in the U.S. In the U.S., people either walked, used their bicycle, or drove a car. Right. There was nothing in between, and the idea that you could actually ride a vehicle like this right. to your office or to right. your school and on the weekends, right. take it out into the, the forest and have fun yeah. was also something that was quite remarkable. And again, showed that whole idea of no matter what the package, the Japanese manufacturers delivered just a little more. Right, and I was just going to say that. And if you can see in this image, maybe we can get a close-up from our dedicated, awesome, unbelievable film team. But you can see there's some fairings on this bike in the poster here. So this is clearly a road bike. Right. And it was probably a few years in uh, that owners said, hey, you know, we would love to take these off road. And they essentially wrote to Honda and said, we'd love to have an extra large sprocket to get a lower gear. And Honda thought about how to do this properly. And they essentially equi equipped these bikes with a toolkit, which has uh, a small tool to uh, pull off the chain and some extra chain to get it on that bigger sprocket. And very quickly, you're locked in and ready to go. And it's astonishing too, when you think about the size of this and the fact that it puts out a massive five horsepower. Right. But with that gearing, you could go absolutely anywhere. Right. And as they also mentioned in the Cycle World article, that if you happen to get stuck, if you get someplace where there just isn't enough power to get you up, it's light enough for you to pick up yeah, the carriage. Yeah, just pick it up, yeah. <laughs> it's that small. It's that small. And um, this one here is a great example. This was, uh, this one's owned by Richard Hunter, uh, who's one of our docents here at the museum. Um, he found this, I think it was like behind a barn somewhere. Uh, it's a very original piece. Uh, it still runs very well. Um, and uh, he has said, essentially with a 10 millimeter wrench, if you put that in your pocket, you're good to go for the rest, for the rest of the day. So uh, in case anything happens, but what a great little bike that you can essentially use every day of your life in, in so many aspects of, of use. The concept of this bike and the execution and the marketing is just absolute proof of what the Japanese manufacturers did and continue to do in terms of really making an impact on the global automotive market. So thanks a lot, Ben, and we look forward to welcoming you to our next detailed video of our exhibition, JDM and Beyond, the Worldwide Influence of Japanese Automobiles. Thanks for joining us.